About a week and a half ago, as I knew that we were coming up on Lord's Supper Sunday, I began to pray and just ponder and think uh, just about the table. Scripture's clear that when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are to do this in remembrance of Christ. He, he, where many of us will be familiar with the passage where he says, take this, is my, this bread is my body broken for you. The body of Christ was physically broken in beatings and in scourging and on the cross. He takes the cup. This is the blood of the new covenant, which is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. And we are to do all of this in remembrance the idea of remembrance is not simply just in memorial or in, uh, oh yeah, that's right, Jesus died on the cross. That, that's not the weight of what Jesus means when He says, remember. It's not just about coming out, oh, we've got to do Lord's Supper, time to check that box off. There is, there is to be a weight that when we as a church gather around and we remember the Lord's body and blood broken and shed, that it is, it is to refresh us, to, to, to call us anew to. And so as I began to just sit with this and, and looking out, seeing a world so broken and battered, wars, attacks, knowing weighty things that many in our church family are facing, just occur, what, what does the table matter? When you and I come time to remember today, what is it that we should be walking away remembering so that this is not just some symbolic checkbox that we check and, and move on and come back for next week when we jump back into Ephesians? Because you and I should be deeply stirred today, and in light of all of the things in light of wars and rumors of wars in the world, in light of exhaustion, financial challenge, medical hardship, loneliness, and we can go on and on with things that many of us in this room are facing, our heads should walk away lifted up. And I want you to turn with me and see exactly how. Turn with me to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John chapter 20. John 20, and we're going to pick up in verse 19. And as you're getting there to John 20, verse 19, let me just remind you what has happened. We're, we're going to pick up the night, Sunday night, the day of the resurrection. The disciples have yet to see Jesus. Instead, what has just transpired in the previous seven days. Seven days prior, they were joyfully celebrating as that day there was the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, citizens in mass shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. There, there was this fervor. The King is here. Then you fast forward. A week of ministry that Thursday night, they share and the Passover meal, Jesus washes their feet. He speaks about how joyously He's longed to have this meal. He shocks them with news that one of them will betray Him. They finish that meal. They sing a hymn of celebration. They go out to Jesus' one of His favorite spots to pray. They're all sleepy, so they don't see Jesus praying in such agony. His sweat becomes as drops of blood. And then they notice a line of torches and movement coming out of the city. Judas walks up, betrays Jesus. Jesus, all of a sudden, is now arrested. He's placed through a sham trial. The disciples who initially said, we'll fight for you, Jesus, they have now all fled they're terrified. Everything, all their hopes, all their dreams, everything they've pinned on Jesus seems as if it is collapsing to the ground. Peter has enough guts to try to get in there, but when confronted with the fact that he's a follower of Jesus, will deny Jesus three times so profanely, the response of those around him is, yep, there's no way you were around Jesus. No one around Jesus talks like that. And as he made that final confession, it says the eyes of Jesus looked up and 
saw Peter, and Peter ran out. Jesus will be scourged, beaten beyond recognition, Isaiah 52. He will be nailed into the cross where He becomes our sin. And while suffering physically on the cross is actually drinking all of eternal hell, God's just sentence for sin, and Jesus dies. His death is shocking to the Roman soldiers. It would be normal for them to break the legs of the one on the cross to, to, to speed up the suffocation process, but they don't break Jesus' legs. He's already dead. Instead, they shove a spirit up his side, and the, mix, the water that flows out, they realize he's gone. He didn't faint. He's not just near death. He's good and dead. Joseph of Arathea, some of the women, they take the body, they bury the body in the tomb on Friday, and Friday night, the disciples go to bed despondent, confused, scared, hopeless. Now Sunday has rolled around. News has reached them earlier in the day from the women that the tomb is empty, Mary has shared that she's seen Jesus. Now, in light of that news, look where the disciples still are. John 20, verse 19. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, this is Resurrection Sunday, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. So where are the disciples? The disciples are closed in. They've locked themselves in. They're afraid. Friday already made them afraid because they are the, the innermost circle of Jesus. Jesus has been crucified by the Romans at the insisting of the Jew, Jewish leaders who had the backing of the Jewish population. So they're already enemy number one, and, 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 and Jesus represents a threat both to the Jews religiously, to the Romans politically. But now the body of Jesus is missing. And we know from the other Gospels that the Jewish leaders, to try to address, because Jesus' body is buried in a known tomb. It's not just thrown in a mass grave. It's buried where anybody can go check and see. And the body's gone. So who do they blame? The disciples. They're not just afraid because their, 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 their teacher, their master has been crucified. They're also afraid because now what has potential to escalate is all being blamed on them. The doors were shut. The disciples were afraid for fear of the Jews. Now watch what happens. Jesus came and stood in their midst, and He said to them, Peace be with you. And when He had said this, He showed them both His hands and His side, the scars. And the disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. You notice how quickly it changes. Here they are in that room. They've locked themselves in. They're living in fear that at any moment the authorities could come and find them out. They dare not leave the city for threat of being seen. And all of a sudden, Jesus, fully alive, glorified body, bearing the scars that He bore on their behalf, He appears Shalom, peace. And notice their instantaneous response. They see those scars and they know for a fact it's Jesus and all of a sudden fear in an instant turns into rejoicing. Turns into overwhelming. Jesus is risen. Their king lives. Their king reigns. When the disciples see Jesus alive, it changes them instantly. And church family, when you and I understand the scars of Jesus, the scars which represent His work on the cross, it's how He got them, when you and I see His scars, it provides perspective, not just perspective, but the right perspective. Because in that moment, prior to Jesus' appearing, the disciples, afraid, anxious, terrified, their perspective is, oh no, the master is dead. 
But the moment they see him alive, perspective changed. They're still being blamed for his disappearance. They're still the scorn of the Jewish authorities. They could still have Rome bear down upon them. But all of a sudden, there's no fear. There's just rejoicing. The perspective has shifted. And church family, you and I need to understand today No matter if you come into this place on cloud nine or you come into this place weary, broken, and battered, we need to be clear today that no matter what we see, no matter what we feel, no matter what what false perspectives we can conjure up, here is the truth. Jesus is alive. Jesus is the King. Jesus is reigning. And Jesus is returning, so we better rejoice. This table, as we remember the scars of Christ, should cause rejoicing. Now, let's be clear what rejoicing is. Rejoicing is not just, sometimes we think of rejoicing, it's just the spontaneous eruption. That can be, but really the, the idea of rejoice, especially when Paul commands it, when you see it command, rejoice. It's the idea not that there is, we can somehow foster this spontaneous emotion, but it's the idea that by the power of our will with our mind, we begin to actively meditate and think and sit and dwell on the goodness and greatness of who Jesus is and what He's done on our behalf for those of us who've been saved by grace through faith. And as we meditate on that, what it produces in the midst of any circumstance, what it produces then is a joy that is unshakable. That is what it means to rejoice. There's no rejoicing if Jesus is in the tomb, but the tomb is empty, which is why he stands in the disciples' midst and shows them scars that no longer have taken his life, but bear testimony to what he bore on their behalf. It is cause for for rejoicing. So you and I come to the table today, it provides perspective. It doesn't only provides perspective, but go back with me. Look at the text. What does he say? They rejoice, but what does he say? He says, peace with you. That's written in, in the Greek language. Likely, he said, shalom. We, we see this term all throughout the Old Testament, peace be with you. When God appears and people are afraid and and, and, and God appears for the purpose of, of good things for the people, what does he say? Peace be with you. And the idea of peace... It's not, it's not simply like we might think of it, the, the absence of conflict. That's a part, but the idea of peace is that relationships are rightly restored. There's harmony. Peace with God is harmony. Once at rebellion with God, now those in Christ are reconciled to God. Peace. Not only peace with God, peace with those in Christ. Not only peace with those in Christ, but peace goes all the way down into restoring my own relationship with myself. The idea of shalom is wholeness. That something that was broken is now whole. He says peace. What do the scars provide? The scars provide peace. Romans 5, 1 tells us that you and I, if you are in Christ, if you have been justified by the grace of God through faith, it says this, you and I have peace with God in Christ. We have peace. You are in Christ. You are no longer at war with God. You have peace. Now, it's possible as a believer not to live in proper fellowship with God. It's possible we should when we are living in sin, and as a believer, when we as a Christian are not walking rightly with God, we should feel the grief of the Holy Spirit. We looked at that last week or several weeks ago. But even when as a, as a Christian I stumble into sin and walk in ways that God is not pleased by, that does not take my peace away. Even when I am distracted and stumbling in my fellowship, I am still at peace. Because if I am in Christ, it is Christ who holds that peace together. It's 
It's not like once we stumble and fall into sin or we get distracted by fears, God goes, you know what? I'm going to kick you out of the house and you'll have to earn your way back in. You'll have to get that piece back. But that's how some of us operate. We hear the whispers and the lies of the enemy. God doesn't want anything to do with you, Christian. How dare you have fallen into that sin? Listen, if we've fallen into sin, we do need to confess it and be restored into right fellowship with God. But the reason we can be restored into right fellowship with God is because in Christ Jesus, by grace through faith, we have peace. We don't earn peace. Jesus earned our peace. And He gives it graciously and He sustains it sovereignly, which means you and I, if we understand this table today, it's time to rest in Christ. Provides perspective, provides peace, provides purpose. Look what he tells them. He says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. I also am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and, or he breathed, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Here's what he says. He says, not only do they now have the correct perspective, Jesus is alive, he's risen, our, there's, there's no more place for fear, now it's time to rejoice. Not only for the first time in history can, can they truly have peace with God, but now they're, they're given a mission, a direction. Jesus says, just as the Father sent me, meaning just as the Father has sent me at the moment of conception and Jesus entered into the womb of Mary when he was born and he lived and he breathed and he moved and he died and he rose just as God sent him, but not just sent then. The idea of that verb is that it starts at that point, but that God is still sending Jesus. The mission of Jesus is still ongoing. The work of redemption finished on the cross. Now it's the proclamation of redemption. That's the mission. The ministry of reconciliation to proclaim that men and women, boys and girls born and they're dead in their trespasses and sins, an act of rebellion against God, can have peace with God for all eternity in Christ. Amen. That mission is still ongoing. Jesus is still working on that mission. How? Well, notice what he says. Just as the Father sent me and I'm still going, so I am sending you. How is, how is Jesus actively working in that mission? Through us, the church. He says, you've got a mission. Well, what is that mission? Well, if you drop down to the end, there's this statement, and it translates weird in English. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. It almost makes it sound that as humans, somehow as a Christian, I get to determine if you get forgiven or not. That's not what he's saying. It is a, a way based on rabbinical teaching to charge the disciples with, with a weighty responsibility that they are to go proclaim the message of the gospel and to do it precisely and accurately so that those who are hearing understand the seriousness. And so by responding to the gospel, to Jesus' offer of salvation by grace through faith, their sins are forgiven. But if they choose to reject that offer, their sins are not forgiven. This is how, this is how one places it. It's the obligation to communicate correctly it's weighty because the people, the people who are hearing, their well-being is at stake. Jesus' followers are to make the gospel so clear that it is evident where people stand on the reality of their sin. The commission to his followers is not one of privileged judgment, but of a weighty responsibility to represent the will of God in Christ with extreme faithfulness and to be honest and authentic as we share it to others. See, here's the reality, church family. God is a God of mission. He's a missional God. We all know the most famous Bible verse, for God so loved the world that He what? That He sent His one and only Son. Other places, that He gave His one and only Son. God is a missional God. God the Father sent God the Son, Jesus. Jesus has a mission. Jesus is active in His mission, and here's what that means for you and I as we come to the table today. One, we rejoice. It's because of the mission of God that any one of us have salvation. But for those of us who've been saved, who make up the church, we now have a mission. We now have a purpose. It is to make disciples. It is as ambassadors of heaven. It is the ministry of reconciliation to see men and women 
brought into right relationship with God. It's a mission that we're to carry out looking like Jesus. Well, how did Jesus go about the mission in his time on earth? Walking in submission, obedient to the Father in every way. Walking in humility. Taking up his cross. Displaying compassion. Speaking the truth in love. All of these are now the way in which we're to carry out this mission. And what is the mission? It's to proclaim the gospel message. To proclaim salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It is to bear witness to the kingdom of God, which is here in part and coming in full. It is an important mission. It's so important that it's arguably the most important thing to the heart of God acting in in human history. And if it's that important to God, then it must hold the same level of importance for each of us. It's a costly mission. For Jesus to carry out the mission, He gave up His own life. For us to carry out the mission means walking in the freedom of Christ, we submit to His will and lay our lives down for the will of God in this world. Church family, understand what do we remember in the midst of a world where we are battered and broken and tossed, where many are wearied. It is because of the scars of Jesus. It is because of His finished work on the cross, not only that you and I can see with correct perspective, not only that you and I have peace with God, but that you and I have active purpose and mission to this life. to be used as an ambassador of heaven, no matter how aimless or hopeless any one of us may feel with the current circumstances we find ourselves in. No matter how much we may be questioning God, here is this situation. I hear pastors saying that I'm to live a life on mission, that you've granted this, this purpose to my time on this earth, but I just don't see how you can take anything out of this mess. I feel extremely confident that is the same question the disciples were asking behind those locked doors when they were afraid, saying, God, we don't understand any of this. How will you bring anything out of this mess? Bring things out of this mess because Jesus is risen. You and I have a purpose and a mission in this world to live out being ambassadors of heaven, and it is a mission and a purpose that when we come to the table, part of what we evaluate is whether or not we are really gripped and faithful living out, we're gripped by that mission and faithful to live out that mission. Does it ever even occur to me to pray for those who don't know Christ? Does it ever occur to me to even try to share the gospel with those who don't know Christ? Does it occur to me to, to take a baby believer and to spend time pouring into them, helping them grow? Does it This is the mission of Jesus, church family, and this is our mission. It is our purpose, this side of heaven. It's a mighty mission. It's a mission that might and it should make all of us feel small, which is why it's good that not only does this table remind us of our purpose and mission, but it also reminds us of God's power to do the mission. Look what he says, in sandwiched in between there. Father sent me, I'm sending you. Receive the Holy Spirit. In a symbolic act that's setting up the disciples to be prepared for what happens in Acts chapter 1, Jesus commands them, there's going to come the time, you the first believers, the Holy Spirit will enter to indwell you. You receive the Holy Spirit. Why? We looked at this Wednesday in Acts chapter 1. Jesus tells the disciples, you're going to be my witnesses in all the world, but don't you dare do any of it until the Holy Spirit enters you, and then you will have the power, the actual ability to go do it. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, whom Jesus says, if I die, I rise, and I ascend to the the, the, the Father's right hand, and I will send the Holy Spirit. It's better for me, disciples, that I go sit in heaven, sitting at the right hand, that I send the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who will convict you of your sin, who when you cry out for salvation will take my blood and regenerate you and make you new, who at that moment will seal you, will place my mark of ownership permanently upon you, who will enter into your body, which is now God's temple. He will enter in and live in you. In living in you, He will remind you of my words. He will empower you to do all of the ministry and things that I have purposed and called for you to do. He will convict you of sin. He will sanctify you, working out 
holiness. He will preserve you in salvation. He will ultimately be the one to bring you to the finish line where you'll be glorified forevermore. Church family, you and I need to understand today and remember at the table that we don't have the power. We need God's power. But when we come to the table, what we remember is the scars of Jesus remind us that if you've been saved by grace through faith, you have been sealed and dwelt by the Holy Spirit of God and the Holy Spirit of God, God Himself, the third person of the Trinity, He delights to empower you and me to go live out the mission of God. None of us lack, if you are in Christ, the table reminds us that none of us lack what is needed to know, love, and follow Jesus and to be a good and faithful servant. The scars provide power. We must walk in His power. So here's the disciples, but what we don't know yet is that there's only 10 there was 12 disciples. Judas betrayed Jesus and, and went and ended his life, but one was missing this night. One was not there to gain the right perspective, to, to hear the summons to peace with God, to embrace the mission and purpose of God, to hear of God's power. No, instead, look with me. It says, but Thomas, one of the 12, called Didymus, the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of his nails and put my finger into the place of his nails and my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, people will come after Thomas hard, doubting Thomas. See the other places in John that Thomas speaks. Thomas very much is just a realist. I want to see it. Thomas says, I've got to have proof. So after eight days, look at with me, verse 26. After eight days, Jesus' disciples were again inside. Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands. Reach here with your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving. Stop your doubt and unbelief, but believe. Now, here's what's remarkable. Was Jesus physically present when Thomas told the other guys, wherever, whenever it was, yep, I need proof and I won't, I, I, the proof is I got, I, got to, I got to touch the scars. No, Jesus wasn't physically present. Did you notice what Jesus just showed up and told Thomas? Thomas, heard you want to see the scars. Here they are. Because even when you and I are not aware of the presence of Christ, our God who knows all, sees all, knows exactly what we say and think. Jesus says, here I am, Thomas. Here's the proof. Reach out. Now here's what's remarkable. Look at Thomas. Thomas answered. Not Thomas touched. Thomas says, i got to touch it for myself, yet in that moment, Jesus in his resurrected state appears, and it is so overwhelming to Thomas, Thomas doesn't touch. Thomas just answers, and look at his answer, my Lord, my God. And this deeply personal encounter with Jesus, Thomas responds in the way that God calls all of us to respond. The call of salvation is to accept Jesus Christ for who He is as Lord and Savior and to acknowledge you need Him to save you. It is, to, it is to come to a point of saying, my Lord, my God, to Jesus Christ. For you and I as believers, our confession, my Lord, my God. The Gospel of John starts with John saying, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And John proceeds to write out a very meticulously structured gospel. And here you get to the end and notice the cry, the cry of the doubter who falls before Jesus and says, my Lord, my God, before the risen Savior, because the proof is overwhelming. And Jesus says, because you've seen me, you're believing. Blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. Blessed are those who will believe based on hearing the truth who will be convinced by the proof as they hear the message. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. Who does that refer to, church family? Every one of us in Christ in this room. Jesus says, you and I who believe by word are more blessed than Thomas who doubted and believed by sight. 
But why is this here? It's here. Look what John says, verse 30. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. Why is this written down? Because you had eyewitness testimony from ten disciples. But if that wasn't good enough, you had one who wasn't there and said, I won't believe it until I see it for myself. And Jesus showed up and said, see it for yourself. And that disciple didn't even follow through. He was so pierced by what he saw that he said, my Lord, my God. And it's written down for our benefit, church family. For our benefit to know that the message we hear is the message of truth, the proof, the eyewitness message. You can go and find the tombs of the great Jewish leaders. You can go find the tombs of the great Muslim leaders. You can go find the tombs of the great leaders of communist faith. But you cannot find a tomb with the body of Jesus. It's empty. There is proof. You say, you go, well, pastor, this perspective, I don't have to be afraid and said there can rejoice that, that, there is, that I can have peace with God, that there is purpose and mission in my life, even in the most painful of circumstances, that, that there is power to actually live out that mission in the midst of the most helpless circumstances. It almost sounds like a fairy tale given the world we live in. And it would be a fairy tale if it weren't for this one fact. It's true. There's proof. The scars provide the proof. The proof that calls every one of us to belief. And when John writes and he says, I've written these things that you may believe, the primary way to understand what he says there is to the person who does not yet believe. To the person who's in this room or watching online and says, I, this is incredible, I would love to have a correct perspective on all of reality so that I wouldn't be driven by the fearful tides of culture, but instead rejoicing in the truth. I, I would love to, to go to bed at night knowing I am at peace with God, my maker, creator. I, I would love to have a, a purpose and a mission for my life that, that carries through all circumstances. These things sound incredible, but I don't know any of this. The message to you today is very simple. If you do not know Jesus Christ by grace through faith, I'm not saying if you don't know about Jesus, pretty much every American knows something about Jesus. I'm not saying if you've never been to Sunday school, start coming to church in Sundays. What I mean is if you have never come to faith in Jesus solely on the basis of His grace, for the salvation of your soul to be reconciled and at peace with God, then hear the cry today. Repent, believe, be saved. If you don't know Christ, you cannot partake of this Lord's Supper biblically. And you can't partake of the Lord's Supper because you cannot partake in anything in Christ. You're on the outside looking in. And Jesus in His loving goodness calls you to salvation today. Now, church family, there's a second aspect of belief there. One is to believe decisively, to, to set it down once for all that you trust. But there's another way it's constructed grammatically that goes beyond that. It's to be resolved and strengthened in your belief that already exists. What I mean by that is for those of us who've already been saved by grace through faith, the, the proof of the passage is designed to strengthen each one of us who already believe. To take the roots of our faith and drive them deeper down into the soil of God. To be able to weather the wind and the ferocity, the storms. To strengthen and resolve your faith. Here's the wild part, Thomas. Thomas who doubted would be Thomas who not only would leave Jerusalem carrying the gospel message, but would find his way as far as modern day India with the gospel of message, who would persist for decades in, in, in carrying out the mission of Jesus until four soldiers' spears ended his life. And we could recount each one of those 11 disciples in that room, all of whom three days prior to the resurrection, scattered in fear, who were huddled terrified. 
10 of those 11 would die horrific martyrs' deaths. John would be the only one spared, but don't think he was weak. He was boiled alive in, in boiling oil. He was exiled on the island of Patmos as an old man. He suffered just as greatly. You see, church family, when you and I understand the perspective of the cross, when we really grasp the peace with God we, can have, we have in Christ, when we are really driven and gripped by the purpose of God and in the mission of our lives, when, when we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, which is only possible because Jesus' work on the cross is finished, when we do that, when we rest in the proof of the Word of God, We who are weak, we who are lowly, we who just like the disciples might have fled back to the ordinary lives of fishermen, we, God, will work in us and through us in ways beyond our wildest imagination. Our hearts should respond today being strengthened. Listen. Isaiah writes, God speaking, Isaiah 49, Zion has said, the Lord has forsaken me, the Lord has forgotten me. There's some in this room as believers who feel, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, I don't know where you are, and I am really struggling. Isaiah says, can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Most don't. But even these may forget, but I will not forget you, God speaking. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands, and your walls are continually before me. Church family, as we come to the table, may our hearts be strengthened because the scars quite literally on your worst day You are in Christ. Jesus looks at those same scars that Thomas once beheld on his hands and sees your name. And when you and I are pierced by that, we will walk out into this world weak, tired, weary, but joy filled at in power. If you feel sightless, there is perspective. If you feel restless, there is peace. If you feel aimless, there is purpose. If you feel helpless, there is power. And if you feel faithless, there is proof because of what we remember at the Lord's Supper today that Jesus broke His body and shed His blood. May we rejoice. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we look to You As we prepare to, to remember you in the Lord's Supper, may our heads, may you lift up our heads. May we behold you on the throne. Where our perspective needs to shift back into your reality, may it be shifted. Where we need to be reminded, Lord, of the might of the peace we have in you, Jesus. Where we need to be recommitted to your purpose where we need to be refilled with your power, where we just need to be strengthened in our hearts with the sure proof that Jesus, you are who you say you are and you have done what you said you've done and you are going to come back and finish all you said you will do. Jesus, may we remember you today. It's in your name I pray.